Thank you, everyone. Um, next up, we have Matt Nelson White. Um, I've known Matt Nelson White for a few few years now, and seen him present a few times, and I've always enjoyed his presentation. Um, recently, Matt has been looking quite a lot into the uh, X509 certificate validation stuff, um, especially with some of the recent releases from Apple. So um, today, Matt is going to tell us all about that with the art of manual X509 X509 certificate <laughs> chain validation in .NET. Thank you, yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Hello. Hello. Hey. How is everybody? Thanks for sticking around uh, for this talk. I imagine many of you arrived on the GPT chat train, um, hype train. Um, can I have a show of hands? Uh, who thinks uh, uh, AGI is probably close within the next five years? Uh, that's uh, artificial general intelligence, like a, a computer person. No? No one? Okay, that's surprising. Well, yeah, I suppose it would. Okay. All right. Well, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't. I mean, it's not like my life has been looking at certificates and um, validating them. Uh, that was just I was doing some uh, work on. Uh, uh, some security protocols, and uh, I just wrote a quick article on it, and then I thought it uh, might be a quick one to just bang out tonight. Uh, maybe you guys will get something useful out of it. I think as developers, we're probably dealing with certificates a lot. Some people know a little bit what they're like, um, you know, how they work under the covers. Some people don't. It's just a black box, and you get a system to give you a certificate, and you plug it in, and the job's done. Um, I, I, The way I like to work is I, I find it beneficial to know how things work down on the low level, and then I operate from first principles most of the time at the magic black box level. So here's a, here's a thing about that. Um, I think historically, I don't know if anyone's tried to do uh, chain validation in .NET. Uh, you might have touched on the X509 chain class in uh, .NET, and uh, maybe you thought, oh, okay, cool, I've got a root certificate. I want to know if this root cert signed my uh, target cert. And uh, then you sort of pulled out your hair as you discovered it doesn't really work very well. And uh, it's really designed to validate against root certs that are in your machine local storage. Um, well, that's been my experience. So moving, I'm going to go. Is it going to go? All right, cool. Yeah, there we go. Transitions. So. Um, I, I use uh, a transition on every slide. You guys are going to love that. <laughs> it's actually the merge transition, so it, it doesn't just fade. It can move things around a bit. So that's a bit of an exciting uh, thing to look forward to. Uh, here's, the, here's the content. Just to give you an idea of what's coming up, I'm going to do an introduction. This is the introduction to the introduction. Um, and then we talk about structure, validation method, uh, encoding. Not going to go really deep into it. No one's going to be really interested on it. I think the takeaway here is just to know broadly how it all works. If you care at all, uh, I've got QR codes throughout. You can just get it. Um, might be easy. Uh, and then go over everyone's favorite bit implementation, where I uh, point you at uh, lots of small character code that you won't be able to read. I reckon you'll be able to read it. I did a bit to try and make it legible. OK, introduction. So what is an X509 certificate? Well, it's basically a cryptographically secure document, which includes proof that it has been unchanged after being issued from an identifiable origin. Um, I didn't look that up. I just saw that's what I think it is. Hopefully, that's right. Um, <coughs> so they're used to do things like uh, transport security. So when you're transmitting data, you can do it over a secure channel. That's basically because embedded into your um, certificate is your public private key and that will help you negotiate uh, um, you know a secure channel uh, it's not always the private key is not always in the certificate obviously you don't want to be uh, giving that to everyone um, interesting cases around non repudiation like uh, digital signatures documents that you're gonna make sure hey this content uh, we vouch from this trusted source it is you know accurate hasn't been changed. Super important for business nowadays. 
Um, there's things like uh, you know, authentication. We might want to uh, issue a certificate to a service to authenticate to another service and not worry about um, you know, user accounts and um, API keys and all the such. And that way can, we can do it part of our public key infrastructure. Uh, we have a, C a certificate authority issuing certificates to our services and you know, we can handle all that that way, which I, I quite like the idea of doing that. Um, and I haven't written this down, but as an aside, uh, like in the mobile space, uh, authentication using protocols like Appetest, uh, quite interesting for cases where you've got an app that, um, you know, for unauthenticated use cases, you, you've got an app, there's no authentication, but you want to make sure that your APIs, your backend APIs aren't being uh, exploited by uh, malicious people. Uh, and in the past, uh, you know, if you look online, they just say, oh, you know, um, store a secret in your code and, you know, that's how you do it. But, you know, that's dumb. Don't do that. Uh, all right, next one. Why is a certificate, uh, sorry, chain validation important? Why is it important? Uh, well, it's a critical part of things like uh, non-repudiation. Uh, you've, got a, you've got a document there, you know um, from the content in the document that it all appears to be um, good. You can validate the document uh, that way that against the, the signature, but you also want to know it comes from a trusted source and that trusted source is basically saying that the contract is uh, valid and accurate. Um, yeah, I wrote a whole heap more in my notes, but I'm not going to bother with it. Um, why or when might I need to know uh, or use this? Uh, well, it's sort of already touched on that. You know, as a developer, um, we probably touch on these things all the time. Maybe we don't give it a second thought. Maybe you don't touch on it at all. And uh, uh, maybe the things I've said here tonight, you have another tool in your tool belt. Um, probably not. I, I imagine most people are using this stuff. Cool. So structure. It's really super, super simple, um, which is surprising because um, when I sought out to just manually parse the, the bytecode of a signature, I imagine it would be very complicated, but it's not, super simple. Um, you've got, at a base level, you've only got three things. Uh, TBS certificate, I've written it this way, I basically copied the text straight from the spec, so that's how they've written it. I just uh, have a habit of slapping my side and... Yeah, so TBS certificate means to be signed certificate. That's effectively the document that's being uh, signed. Um, and that's structured as well. Uh, signature algorithm. So that's a little bit of information there that tells us what signature and hash, what signature algorithm and hash algorithm has been used to sign document. And the final one there is a signature value. It's a, I went through, um, yeah, it's just a big, big old string of bytes used for verification. Um, may have skipped a bit ahead from, uh, yeah, so TBS certificate, uh, for the purposes of verifying the signature, there's a little bit of information nested in there we want to extract. Um, it's sitting in a hierarchy like this. You've got the TBS certificate, then the public uh, subject public key, uh, and as you might guess, that's the public key. Um, in the uh, certificate and the actual bytes for the subject, uh, the, the public key all the way down here. Uh, and there's another little algorithm identifier there. <coughs> oh, cool. There's a transition I was toiling you about. So <laughs> I don't think any of them are that showy. Like we don't have spinning lines going on. But um, so then the, the second bit of information you really want to get just for the purpose of validation, is you want to know what algorithm is being used to uh, sign your signature. So, yeah, you know, unsurprisingly, you get it right here. This other little thingy here, uh, I'm not sure if anyone sort of encountered the term uh, elliptical curves. Um, it's an area of cryptography. Um, you have uh, some variables, parameters for elliptical curve cryptography to define the curve. They, they sit over here. And there's probably other sort of um, algorithms that have additional parameters that you might want to use. That's where they sit. And uh, yeah, there's not really a lot to say about the signature value other than it's a big old string of bytes. Cool uh, validation method. So um, 
there's, there's, two, there's two documents involved here. We've got the signing uh, certificate. I've called it signer here for some reason. And then you've got the sign certificate. And uh, we're really interested in um, just these bits of information from each of them. Uh, I'm hoping that's legible at the back. You're not paying attention anyway, Till, so that's fine. Um, so you already know what the public, uh, subject public key is. That's basically the public certificate for the signer. Uh, you know, you'd imagine that we use that in validating the, the sign certificate, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, the we also um, need to extract some information from the signature algorithm. And obviously we want to validate that the TBS certificate uh, the signature is valid and the uh, has been uh, issued by the, or created by the signer. Cool. Uh, so signature algorithm, um, it sort of encodes two bits of useful information in there. Uh, we want to know what algorithm, signature algorithm is actually used, like RSA or, or an elliptical curve, um, whatever that is, digital something, something, something. Uh, and the hashing algorithm, uh, algorithm, there's lots out there, uh, but as an example, like SHA or MD5, MD5 is super secure, use it everywhere. Um, cool. Uh, so the overall method, um, once we've extracted the signature algorithm and the hashing algorithm, we take the subject public key from the signing certificate, signature value from the signed, uh, and the TBS certificate from the signed, feed it into this function for validation and it tells us uh, true or false, yes or no, happy or sad. Um, oh cool, all right, so everyone's super hyped about ChatGPT and uh, I thought it was probably a fool's errand to do a talk that isn't involved in it some way, so I asked it to describe to me what is ASN1. Um, no one's gonna be able to read that, so I just summarize it on the side. I used my human brain to do that. So um, the certificate is uses an encoding called abstract syntax notation. Um, it's a pretty common encoding using used within engineering, uh, comms engineering, stuff like that. Um, it's just a way of uh, formatting uh, uh, st no, structured data into a byte encoding. It's uh, platform independent, you can use it everywhere, it's used everywhere. Um, it has some different types of encoding rules. Uh, don't want to go into it too much, but B, basic encoding rules is a, like the most uh, permissive uh, rules that you can basically use everywhere. Um, and the CER and DER, which you might be more familiar with if you've had some exposure to things like issuing certificates or certificates uh, in Linux systems with OpenSSL, you probably encountered those terms. Those are more um, constrained uh, encoding rules. Um, Generally, I mean, this is pretty much gonna work everywhere and these work in certain cases. Uh, one of the things I didn't really know when I was writing um, code to just uh, uh, parse the certificate is how to determine which of those encoding rules are being used. Um, I didn't bother because for my case, I didn't really need to know. I just always use um, basic encoding rules, uh, but I did a little bit of research on it. Um, I think, uh, there, there are little indicators you can see in the uh, information with the encoding that indicates it's using a particular type of encoding rules, but that's not gonna make a lot of sense right now. I'll go on that on a later slide. Um, it, it can express different data types, and I think I already said it's widely used. Uh, incidentally, this is the second thing I used uh, ChatGPT to generate. The title was generated. I had a crappy title, and, but this one used the, like, the art of um, uh, validation, which I thought was really cool, and I put a little bit of art to the side, I'm not sure if you noticed. Cool, um, so uh, just like everything that's good, it's really simple, and um, there's only three things uh, for the ASN encoding. It's uh, basically a tag, a byte, followed by um, uh, and then the value of the thing that you're you know, representing in the ASN. So by means of an example, um, we've got some stuff here. So um, three is the tag that indicates I'm uh, you know, encoding an octet string, just a sequence of bytes. Four, as you might imagine, is four bytes. And uh, surprise, here are the four bytes. Is that four? One, two, three, and no. So it's, it's an odd number of things, isn't it? One, two, yeah, oh, 
Never mind. <laughs> uh, implementation. So I tried to make it really simple to follow. Um, there's a few things you've got to keep in your mind. So I color coded the, um, you know, the things. I don't know if you can, everyone can see that. It's a bit obscure. Uh, with the, the blocks. Um, don't know if that helps. Um, but those are all the things that we sort of covered before, and I'll try and go over it in the implementation. So I sort of alluded that uh, we want to extract two bits of information from the signature al algorithm. Um, really what you're looking at there in the signature al algorithm is an OID, an object identifier. And it looks like that. It's a, like a string of numbers separated by periods that meant to indicate a hierarchy of identifiers. Uh, and it generally encodes things like uh, um, uh, a body that sort of regulates the hierarchy and you know the type of um, uh, a thing that follows, like a, a, there's a member body and then the um, or, uh, country. I think 840 is actually U United States. And then you have companies and then maybe a division or uh, protocol and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, there's you know, certain hierarchies are controlled, certain other hierarchies are not controlled. Um, and if you want to use them, generally don't use one that's controlled. These ones correspond to these um, algorithms. So some of you with good eyesight might be able to tell already that there's some commonality between them. Um, the, you can see that they all share this prefix. And this prefix basically means it's ISO um, member body US RSA, RSA DSI, uh, PKCS, PKCS1, and then we've got a little identifier at the end to tell us the hashing algorithm. Um, RSA is the, uh, the name of the company that did that standard. Um, PKCS is a standard body for um, uh, public key cryptography, I believe. PKCS1 is the first version of that standard. Um, and then under that, we've got dot 11, dot 12, dot 13. There's a bunch of other ones as well I didn't bother to do. You've got some crappy um, hashing algorithms like MD5. Um, but the ones that I cared about, you know, the are fairly modern ones. So there they are. Um, all right, so moving along. So writing a bit of code to do this, uh, you know, there's nothing groundbreaking here. Um, but what was, what was cool is that Microsoft has a little, nice little page documentation. There's the QR code. It gives you a handy little lookup for um, common algorithms and the OIDs. Saves you trawling through, you know, infinite. Um, and, you know, we just got a bit of code here to basically look at a prefix of a um, algorithm that we want to support when we're writing our code um, to indicate uh, the signature algorithm. Um, and then usually under that in the hierarchy are going to be, um, you know, different hashing algorithms for that signature algorithm. So what we've got over here is highlighted. These are, these are the ones for RSA that I chose to write about. And over here, we've got the prefix for uh, elliptical curve and the, uh, the same hashing algorithms, uh, but, you know, different, uh, different suffixes. So, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, so I try to leverage the Microsoft APIs as much as possible, but uh, if any of you have ever used a Microsoft API before, they're only barely useful. Um, generally, I think they... Um, they like to publicly expose some APIs that they may use internally, but they never really consider the common use cases and they're sort of half useful. Um, so there's generally a bunch of things that, that doesn't do and you want it to do, but in this case, uh, critically off the X509 Certificate 2 um, class, we've got uh, useful uh, methods to extract the different types of public keys that we want to use, RSA1 and elliptical curve 1. Um, so I haven't bothered highlighting it. That's really small. I doubt anyone can read it, but there's just a method here to, to get that key out, and there's a method here to get the other one out. Um, they work very differently. Um, so, you know, they need to be configured differently. Uh, all right, cool. 
Uh, next cool thing uh, that Microsoft does is they have a ASN decoder class. Uh, so you don't have to write your own ASN decoder, which is a annoyance that I did. Um, and we've got a lot of code that's definitely not readable from your distance, but I'll just talk through it. So on the left here, we have um, actually a notation for ASN1 to describe the data structure for the certificate. Um, if we invested in like a bigger screen, you'd be able to read it. But uh, so we've got the certificate, TBS certificate structure with a bunch of stuff that I haven't touched on because it doesn't matter. Um, and then the algorithm identifier, which is the data type used for the signature algorithm. So the purpose of this bit of code here is to um, decode the certificate data, big old blob of data, and extract from it the value of the signature, which is basically the last uh, data property there on that structure. So the first thing we need to do is unwrap the certificate structure, which is a sequence type. So I get the big old blob, I use the ASN decoder, I read the sequence, and what it outputs by reference is the, you know, the offset of bytes and the length of bytes that my certificate is in. Because I don't like allocating, um, I use uh, span, as we all should, um, and then I get that uh, a slice of the, that, those bytes, and I can do some more operations on it. Uh, next operation, as you might imagine, is I want to find how big is the TBS certificate, so I can go to the end of it and read the next thing. That's precisely what I do. Um, the TBS certificate is another sequence type, so I just say, hey, give me another sequence. Where does it start? Where does it end? And then I get another um, uh, segment of the, uh, as a range, actually, of the span this time to get the next bit of data to read. Uh, signature algorithm, oh, it's another sequence, I do the same thing. Uh, but the last one is a bit string. So we use a send decoder, read bit string, and we get it. So cool, we've uh, got a function that now extracts the signature value from the certificate. And the reason we did all this bullshit is because Microsoft API, uh, API for X509 Certificate 2 does not have a way to extract this, uh, this data. Seems like a big oversight because it's a you know, pretty important part of this uh, certificate. Uh, look, um, extracting the TBS certificate, we kind of already did it. Um, so we discovered the region of uh, the bytes that the TBS certificate sits in. But there's a, a nice little gotcha there that if you don't know, you'll be like, ah, oh, what's going on here? This is stupid. Uh, and th that's the thing that you can't actually see on the last line that says that um, I've got these weird sort of, uh, um, I've got a four byte uh, subtraction on the TBS offset. And that's because um, the, the TBS certificate that you actually need to use for the purposes of validating includes the ASN uh, one um, pre uh, like little preamble thing there. So that's just a thing you gotta know. Cool, oh man, I'm, I'm smashing it for time. Um, you guys would be real happy with this. Um, so bringing it all together now, and we're gonna validate the data with this big old um, heap of code. Uh, and what I'm do gonna do is just go through each of those elements, ho highlight where they are on the code, explain the sequence, and then at the end, we've got a yes or a no, whether it's valid. So uh, first one here, we wanna extract the signature value. This is this blurry thing up here. Um, that's the signature, I'm getting that with the extension that I wrote. And um, then the next thing I'm doing, getting the TBS certificate bytes. Um, and again, I didn't bother saying it, but uh, Microsoft doesn't expose any way of getting that, so that's why I've written that uh, extension, rather than using their own, because it doesn't exist. Um, they do, however, provide a way of extracting the uh, signed, the signature algorithm from the signed certificate, and that's, you know, the code that I've already sh shown you. We've, we're identifying by the prefix, the OID, and then f uh, furthermore, we're identifying the hashing algorithm using the suffix, um, all cool. Um, subject, public key. Uh, so we're getting that from the signer. 
and we know that once we've identified through the OID prefix, we know which one to do through the, you know, the nice little methods Microsoft gives us. And that gives us this um, public key object, which has a handy little thing called verified data. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to verify the data of the TBS certificate. We feed it in the TBS certificate, unsurprisingly. We feed it in the signature, the thing that verifies it all. Uh, we feed it in the hashing algorithm, which is, you know, you know gone over that. Um, and then there's uh, these cool little configuration parameters at the end, which I haven't talked about at all, um, and they can screw you up. So you may have remembered on the uh, RSA OID example I gave you, it's sitting under the PKCS1 um, OID. Um, the PKCS1 uh, parameter here basically talks about um, the sort of padding that needs to be done. If I remember correctly, um, the, uh, the data that you're creating a signature for needs to fit into um, a certain byte size interval, and if it doesn't line up correctly, it needs to add some padding, and uh, the verification needs to know that that method of padding has been used, that's what it's for, there for. Uh, the second one here is a bit of a foot gun, um, like I was really angry about it because the verify method uh, for this uh, public key has an overload which doesn't have that parameter all, at all, and actually defaults to a configuration value that's not really that common. So I, I, I went down to a crazy low level to work out why this wasn't working, and it turns out there was just an overloaded method that I wasn't aware of that I could put this configuration in. I wish I could tell you what RFC 3279DR sequence is and how it relates to this, but I didn't bother. I just got it working and it worked for my purposes. Um, I can use that as an exercise for the audience. Tell me at the next meetup what it is. Um, yeah, and at the end of that, we're, we're done. Woo. Um, thanks very much. I know it's a very technical and boring topic, but um, I feel like you guys came along with me. Um, shut up for a second. Uh, this uh, QR code here will take you to the article I wrote. Go ahead. Questions? HTTPS, SSL. TLS. Yep, that's right, spot on. Yeah, so um, over like TLS, uh, uh, SSL, you only are going to use it for um, uh, creating a shared key using like Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange, using the public and private keys on each end. Um, but uh, the HTTP part of the implementation of that will send across um, information about the certificate as well that you can use for non-repudiation purposes. So you can say, cool, got a secure channel for um, communication. And then you can also say, oh, okay, cool, this is actually the ANZ bank, not, um, you know, someone else. There's also an extension to it, RFC 3779, which is to do with resource public key infrastructure. Oh, very cool. So you can add an IPv4 address and an IPv6 address to it as well. Oh, as um, like extension attributes into the certificate? Yeah. yeah, we all do that anyway. That's like the, the what you need to do to um, make a valid uh, service certificate nowadays. Mm -hmm. You've got SAN, subject to alternate names, yeah. IP addresses, DNS names, all that sort of shit. I have stuff, sorry. Um, yeah, actually, uh, that's a really interesting space because, because the TBS is just a document. Um, for the thing I did recently, I put a bunch of domain-specific stuff in there, like uh, the customer ID, or um, for a specific purpose, I had a campaign ID. And I'd give this to a client and say, you know, just provide me with a certificate. You don't need to give me anything else. And then I can tell it's come from my CA, and um, uh, I, I, I can basically verify their identity, the purposes that they're going to use the certificate. Um, using that uh, extension attribute, I can say, oh, well, you can only have information for this customer in this campaign. And you can put whatever you want in there. Hey. Is the, oh, yeah. uh, I didn't know your name, but this guy, Mr. T. Is the signature and the signature parameter is included in that hash that's part of the, like, the, that sign? Like, could you downgrade to MB5 from JAR and, like, do a collision with one of those or something else? As far as, like, um, downgrades, I think that happens in only in uh, the transport layer security as and working out the different ciphers that you can use as far as... I guess is the signature algorithm part, because I've heard something you have to... That's not part of the signature data, so the TBS is... It's only, um, and, you know, the... So you can modify the, the, the signature algorithm... Correct. ...and it won't yeah, affect the... 100%, but it won't work, it won't validate, because it produces different hashes. 
Yeah. So there's no real um, vulnerability in doing that. You're just going to get a broken validation method. Um, but yeah, you just don't don't use MD5. Um, and I think there there is a, were, were attack vectors around uh, like downgrading to um, insecure uh, hash uh, signature al no um, algorithms anyway, uh, which is probably what you're alluding to. But that's for the transport layer stuff. Sorry. Oh yeah. Um, uh, so I um, what was I doing? Um, yeah, I was doing. I I was researching the Apatest protocol, which I sort of alluded to earlier, and that does a lot of interesting stuff over a bunch of different uh, um, standards. Um, but the the annoying part of it is that there isn't any implementation for it. So I had to research the protocol um, and implement it myself, um, which uh, I I need. I wanted to um, verify the certificate. But different um, types of certificates. I really just had one, um, so I only had to write to that. And I didn't want to pull in a massive library just to do it, like uh, Bouncy Castle. There's a bunch of stuff relating to the process I just don't need. So only a couple lines of li code that does the thing I wanted. So could you just um, elaborate a little bit more on, on Apple, Apple and, um, what Oh, that's a whole nother talk. I'm happy to get. Like, how, are you guys tired? You guys want to go home or? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, uh, for the app developers amongst us, um, you may have encountered situations where you are not authenticating your users. Uh, and more often than not, we've got APIs that are backing our apps. So we don't want some other dude hitting our APIs that's not using our app. But for unauthenticated scenarios, how do you do that? So um, uh, the, the dumb people will say, oh, well, you just um, embed the secret inside the application, and we all know because we're really competent that that's security by obfuscation, and we don't do that. Um, so the cool thing about Apatest, and this is implemented by both Apple and Android, is um, they make use of the secure enclave on the device, this protected encrypted area that we're not allowed to access as users, um, and they effectively um, issue a certificate for the purposes of authentication to your application. Uh, so uh, behind the scenes, there's like an intermediate certificate authority on the device, and there's a, a root certificate authority. There's probably a few intermediates, who knows? Um, but anyway, you can download the root certificate. The, uh, there's a whole web authentication protocol you need to implement, but the app basically says to your backend API, hey, here is my attestation, which includes some cryptographic stuff uh, that's been issued by the secure enclave to validate you're using uh, the app on a device legitimately. And that, okay, you decode all that, but in essence, you validate the uh, payload against the certificate, and then away you go. So that blocks out the, um, the, the, the bad actors from uh, I don't know, exploiting your APIs or maybe just using them for free. I don't know. But uh, that's the, the way you should be doing it. What's it app? app a test. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that should um, bring up stuff on your Google searches or your, your chat GPT queries. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, look, a uh, bit of a shameless plug. I have a, uh, a library that I don't think I've even published yet, but um, you can get it on my GitHub. Um, you probably find it through that link somehow. Uh, and I've got a library there that works for it. It's a fairly complicated protocol, actually, to implement. It was good fun doing it. Anything else? Oh, cool. Hey. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, what you're alluding to, you can do like a certificate rev rev revocation list, CRL. You've got to uh, download a big old list. Um, or you've got things like OCSP, which is an API to um, do revocation checks without downloading an entire massive list, which you can imagine, if you had it going for a long time, can be very, very long and big. Um, no, I didn't do any of that. I didn't care about any of that. For the um, use case, there isn't really any revocation. Um, they've got different things around that for Apatest. 
And, and I didn't do any other stuff like, um, you know, uh, not before, not after, um, uh, usages. Well, there's lots of other information you can pack into the TBS certificate to say, you know, how it should be used or when it should be used. Didn't do any of that. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Matt. You're very welcome. Fascinating.